Welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's been a little bit since the last video. Uh, I've been really, really busy. Uh, I really haven't had a lot of time to actually sit down and edit this video for these trusses, but finally got some time uh, at least shoot this part of the video anyway, and then uh, get into editing and get this thing spit out. So uh, it's just been weeks and weeks of constant emails and phone calls and work and I mean, you name it. So uh, sorry for the delay, but here we are, finally. Something that I've been wanting to do for a while is some large timber framing. And what better place to do it than in my house? So, I sat down and looked at a bunch of different types of trusses. Then I saw scissor trusses. And these trusses are phenomenal. So I sat down and started designing these things. Um, my original plan was to go with like 6 by 12 timbers. Like massive timbers. Because I'm thinking, okay, these things are holding up the entire roof. They got to be really big. So once I got my plans, I sent them to a company called Texas Timber Frames. They're in Bernie, Texas, not far from me here, and they do phenomenal timber work. Um, they're one of the only timber home manufacturers in Texas. Um, every, every other place that I called, they had to get them made somewhere else out of state, and they had to ship them over here, and then had to assemble them on site. And uh, so their costs would have gone up. Texas Timber Frames, though, uh, they're proud of their work, uh, but for good reason. I uh, come to find out this was a tremendous amount of work. Anyway, so I got a quote from them and I won't quote the number, but it was sticker shock. It was, it was considerably higher than I was expecting. Well, our budget just couldn't afford that kind of hit and we wanted to have these trusses in the house. So I decided that I'll build them myself, but I had to figure out, okay, well, if I'm building them myself, how do I know how big of a timber do I need? How big of plates do I need? Size of bolts do I need? And I scratched my head on this for quite some time. Texas Timber Frames, they, because of liability issues, they wouldn't design them for me and send me the plans if they weren't the ones to build it, which is completely reasonable. This is a, this is a large piece of material that's holding up a lot of weight. So if, for them to not have their hands in it and then pass it off to somebody else, that's, that's just too much for them to ask. Or it's too much to ask for them. So can't fault them for that. Um... In our conversations, though, I was able to glean some information and determine that I needed 4x12s for my main rafters and then 4x10s for my scissors. Um, <clears throat> and one of my trusses, I got away with doing 4x10 all the way around. That's the smaller one going over the front doors. So at least I had my lumber sizes figured out. Then I had to figure out, okay, my plate size and my bolt size. Just did a whole lot of Googling, a lot of reading, a little bit of math. And uh, I determined that a 3 16 inch plate with uh, 3 quarter inch bolts would do the job. 3 quarter inch bolts are a little overkill, but I wanted the size of those bolts to uh, be a factor, um, aesthetically anyway. They don't do it. The extra thickness in bolt doesn't do anything for actual strength of the truss. Uh, most of that is in the lumber itself and in the plates. And just make sure you got a good connection there. So anyway, it went a little overkill, but you know, when in doubt, go overboard, right? So, <clears throat> as I said, the cost to have them built was significant. Um, the cost to build them, on the other hand, was quite a bit less. I kept wondering myself, I was like, why in the world do these things cost so much when the material costs, you know, so little? Uh, I quickly found out why. Uh, this was an obscene amount of work. Uh, I like to kill my dad doing this. So it finally came time to start cutting these timbers. The hardest part about cutting these things was their sheer weight. These things are really heavy. The big ones weigh 260, 270. Uh, even the small ones are, you know, 100 pounds. So it was a lot of work. Uh, my dad was sweating it out here. He's he, he retired a couple of years ago, and he's gotten a little thicker on the middle. And as you can see by this photo, he's put his pants picking up one of these timbers. So either the timbers were getting really heavy or his pants are getting a little tight. Uh, we'll, let, we'll let God be the judge of that one. Anyway, um, so to cut these things... Uh, we just cut them right there on the pile, um, slid out what we needed to slide out. I designed these in SketchUp and had all my measurements printed out ahead of time. So we just took those out to site, made some measurements, got some really accurate uh, cut lines drawn, and then started cutting. Now that was pretty straightforward. Um, cutting them really wasn't all that much different than cutting any other type of piece of lumber I do in the garage for making furniture. Only difference here is that my saw wouldn't cut all the way through and wouldn't pass, so I had to cut one side flip it and then cut the other side and then pray that I got the two cuts close. Uh, most of them turned out pretty well. I had a few in here that I had to touch up with a, uh, uh, a hand planer, but uh, you know, they turned out pretty good for 
and honestly for what these are i don't need i didn't need to be that accurate or that meticulous about these cuts but from making furniture you know out of hardwoods and everything's got to be just so close and the fit's got to be just perfect um, it's hard to not do that even when dealing with a large piece of lumber like this but they, the fit turned out phenomenal so. so after all the cutting was done then it was time to lay these things out stick the plates on top of them and start marking our holes this is where the work really started to set in because we had to lay these things out accurately we had to lay them out flat well the foundation wasn't poured yet the the farms were still being set up and the guys were still putting in fill material so we didn't have a large flat work surface to work on and i couldn't afford to wait until the slab was done to do all of this because that would have put the rest of my project behind so we came up with the next best option we built a whole bunch of sawhorses then we can't, then we found our next problem sawhorses are on dirt that's full of rocks and the sawhorses like to sink and they get bumped around so no matter how you lay these sawhorses out, you're not going to have a flat surface, or at least not a level surface. So we had to take some two by four and scab onto the sides of these things and then draw a string line with the bubble level on there and then level up the tops of all of these little two by fours on top of these sawhorses. Once that was done, we were able to take the big beams, carry them over, and then put them on top. And even then, they weren't laying up perfectly. They, everything was twisted one way or the other just a little bit. But they were close enough that we could get the plates on there, throw some clamps on it, and kind of bring everything together so that we could mark our holes accurately. What we did find when we were putting these things together was that modeling these in SketchUp and then printing out those cut that cut list and then cutting from that cut list worked out pretty well. Um, I didn't have a single piece out here that had to be recut because it was too long or too short or the angle was off. Once we got them laid up there and we noticed and we found that the plates actually fit on there and everything looked good, it was time to start drilling the holes. That's when our next problem set in. How do you drill a hole through four inches of material straight without some kind of really expensive jig? Um, I can drill a pretty straight hole, but 642 of them is a lot to ask if you're doing it by your eyeball. So what I did was I took a couple pieces of cutoffs that I had out here, screwed them together, and then took it, up, took it back to the house and stuck it on the drill press and then drilled a nice straight hole right on through eight inches of material. That allowed us to slide that auger bit through that block and then line up the end of that auger bit on our hole lay the block down clamp it so it doesn't go anywhere and then drill straight through the beams this actually worked out really really well um, i only had a couple holes here and there that were off just enough that we had to actually do something with it later the vast majority of them straight through lined up on both sides of the timbers without any issues at all so that system worked out pretty well I did, however, have to re-drill that hole in that block every day. Because by the end of the day, you're looking, you know, ballpark 200 holes per day. Uh, it wore that hole out enough that they were starting to get some slop in it by the end of the day. So when we were done drilling for the day, I would bring the block home, take the bit with me, drill a new hole, come back out the next morning with a fresh guy. And uh turned out great. Oh, damn it. Yeah! Oh, Be like a little salty. <laughs> you over there, out of the way, nice and safe. <laughs> now, while I was busy doing all the fab work out here with my dad, I had my buddy Robert Gutierrez uh, with GTZ powder coating doing the plates. He had his hands full of hair. I handed to him 96 plates. Uh, some of these plates are pretty big, uh, weigh around 15, 16 pounds. Got a lot of holes, a lot of edges. There's mill scale all over them. They were pretty cruddy. So he set out first by sandblasting every one of these plates. Once they were sandblasted, uh, he set out starting to prime them. Uh, he used a zinc-based primer. Without that zinc-based primer, you run the risk of getting rust underneath that powder coat, or if it takes a ding or something like that, you can get rust showing up eventually. Um, it's something that he's seen in the past with some outdoor stuff. So he went in the extra mile and primed them for me before he stuck our final That's coat of finish on it. Once they were primed, we had chosen a, a textured finish. It's kind of got a matte finish, but it actually has a texture of like 200 grit sandpaper. It's a really sleek looking finish. We didn't want just a plain black look like it was spray painted with something. We wanted something that would kind of stand out a little bit. So we went with that mini texture and it turned out phenomenal. Gutierrez did a phenomenal job on these truss, on these truss plates and I can't recommend him highly enough. 
So if you're in the San Antonio area or anywhere else and you're looking for somebody to do powder coating, hit him up. I'll leave a link below in the description. So once all the fab work was done to include all of the cutting and all of these damn holes and the plates were finally finished up, it was finally time to start putting these things together. So my dad came back in town from Oklahoma and we went straight to work putting these things together. Now, I had thought that putting these together would have been the easy part. You know, we were going to have a sky track out here to help doing the lifting because uh, there was no way in hell we were going to be lifting these trusses up by ourselves. They're way too heavy for that. Uh, we're estimating about a thousand pounds of truss here. So I had a sky track out here, nice flat work surface work on, I had a game plan. It's like, we're going to knock these things out in just a couple days. Yeah, not so much. Um, <laughs> putting them together was almost more work than cutting and drilling all those damn holes. Reason being was the bolts were damn near the exact same size as the bore holes. Either that or there was just enough fuzz inside of these boards that you had to pound every damn one of these bolts through. And I mean, pound them in. And when we first started doing this, we didn't have proper mallets. We figured the bolts were just going to drop in. So I come out here with nothing to beat them in with. So we just grabbed the next best thing and it was a piece of cutoff. So we're out here wailing on these bolts caveman style to get these bolts through these beams. And uh, that worked out pretty well. The problem is, is that it was tearing up our hands and the end of the wood was starting to get splintered. And when you got the bolt real close to the plate, that end of that splintered wood would hit the plate and it would mar the finish just ever so slightly. So next day I went out and I actually got a proper set of mallets. And uh, these things made a world of difference. They were easier to swing, easier on our hands, and it drove the bolts in so much better. Not to say our caveman tools weren't fun to use, but that was a lot of work. Once the bolts were pounded through, or at least a couple of them anyway, we take that bottom plate, line it up underneath there, and get it started. And pray to God that we got the bolt hole that wasn't off to line it up. Because if you started with that one, then all your other bolts are going to be off. Uh, we lucked out, and I think we only had that happen maybe once. Now, as we started laying in the bottom plate, that's when you start to notice if your holes are a little off one way or the other. Like I said, the vast majority of them went through no problem, but we had a few that we had to finesse. Originally we thought, hey, you know what? It's just pretty soft wood. I'll just get a rat tail file and we'll just file out that hole. Didn't think that even if, even though it's soft wood, you're still trying to ream out four inches of material. And uh, that just wasn't working. So next best thing, we grabbed the auger bit. I didn't want to do this because I was worried that the auger bit would hit the plate and knock off the finish and then I'd get rusted it later. But we really didn't have any other options here. So I just took my time with the auger bit and put a little muscle into one side of the hole and got them all re got the ones reboard that I needed to reboard and uh, it went pretty well I had I had one or two that were really really way off and took some effort uh, to get re-drilled but all in all went pretty well so the process of just pounding all these bolts in and sticking these things together just continued the big trusses have like 64 60 something bolts together I don't remember the number off the top of my head but it's a lot of damn bolts I can tell you that once they were all put together then we stood them up uh, now came the next problem, is where do we put these things now that they're complete? Uh, my original thought here was to just stand them up on their ends like they would be sitting in the house and just throw some 2 by 4s on the legs to brace them standing up. That wasn't going to work. Uh, the first little one off the ground is like 9 feet, and that thing is tiny compared to these other ones. We took the first, first completed scissor truss and stood it up, and it was towering above the trees out here no way were we leaving all of that standing up in the wind. I mean, because the majority of the mass is up in the air, a good 10, 12 feet. So it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, so we had to lay them down. Well, laying the first one down is a piece of cake. It's your second, third, fourth, and eighth one that cause problems. How do you lay this thing down without jacking up the, others, the rest of them that are on the stack? Once we got the first one laid down, we put some blocks on top of the second one and lay the truss down and ease it into place and then let it start setting on that first truss and get our blocks sorted out and then lay it on over and then shimmy it around. We did that for about the first four or five. After a little bit, we realized, you know what? Why don't we try picking up the truss flat? Uh, and I didn't, well, I didn't want to use the forks of the Skytrack to do that because I didn't want to jack up the, the surface of the wood or hit a plate, God forbid. So we threw two straps over the interior scissors and um, surprisingly, it picked up just fine. There was very little deflection in the uh, overall truss and it stayed flat. So we just pick it up off of the foundation, lay it flat on the ground on some blocks and then reposition our straps, pick it right back up, then slide it right in on top of the stack that was already there 
and away we went. It worked out really, really well. Uh, now getting them off of there, I think we're probably going to do something similar. Pick them up flat, lay them on the ground, and then recenter our strap from the top of the peak and then swing them over and onto the house. Well, so that's it for this video, guys. Like I said before in the beginning of the video, I'm not an engineer and I certainly have zero experience doing timber framing. So don't take anything in this video as the way to do it, uh, your own trusses. Just don't do it. That's a, it's a huge risk to do it by yourself if you don't know what you're doing. I'm not 100% sure I know what I'm doing, but I got enough information from the pros that I feel pretty confident that this is going to work out just fine. So if you do do that, build at your own risk. That being said, uh, looking forward to putting out the next video. It'll be the foundation work and the lot clearing and all that stuff. Hopefully it'll be shortly after this one drops. Once that's done, then it's continuing on the framing behind me. We're supposed to be flying these trusses up here in a couple of days, I think. And uh, assuming I can get all my LVLs here, but that's another issue we'll cover in the next video. Anyway, again, big shout out to Texas Timber Frames and Bernie. Uh, they sent me some phenomenal lumber. I was not going to be able to find this quality of Douglas fir anywhere else, and certainly not for this price. Um, their price was pretty much on par with every other lumber supplier that I could find, but the biggest difference was is that their lumber is way, way better. No huge knot holes. I mean, there's knots in it, but there's no big holes in it. It's pretty dry. It's plain. It's flat. It's square. Dimensionally, beam to beam, they're exactly the same. This is the type of quality you would look for if you're buying S4S walnut or maple. So these are really, really good beams. So can't uh, can't thank those guys enough. They've been a huge help in getting me all this material, and I couldn't have done it without them. Uh, also, a big thanks to Robert Gutierrez over at GTZ Powder Coating. Brother, these things look phenomenal. I can't wait to see these things in top of this house. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Stay tuned for these next videos. Catch you next time.